All right. Finally ready to go. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rich Rand. I'm the chair of the physics and astronomy department here at UNM. But I am not the best person to introduce our esteemed speaker today, Nobel laureate John Mather. Uh, the best person to introduce him is one of our adjunct faculty, Tony Hull. Uh, Tony is an astronomer, and he has worked on uh, many, many important telescopes over his career and has known John for many years. And in particular, Tony worked on the JWST itself, leading a team of uh, over 50 uh, engineers and scientists who uh, made sure that the mirrors on the JWST were ground to the right shape. And if they're not the right shape, you don't get a sharp image. And some of you who are old enough to remember what happened with the Hubble when it first. So thanks to Tony, we avoided that. Okay, so uh, I'll hand it over to Tony, uh, who will introduce John. Uh, thank you very much, Rich. Thank you all for coming. It's so wonderful to see such a turnout for astronomy, for the stars, for space. And we're so privileged to have John here with us today. John has been amazing in his persistence for doing evidence-based science. And he is the first to confirm the Big Bang. We're not supposed to use that term. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> uh, the, the shape of the, of the radiation from the early universe. He did this experimentally, and he found some wonderful things when he did that, that the primordial radiation is not uniform, that it's varied in different, uh, different directions. And this began to suggest all sorts of wonderful things to do. Well, he, he did the COBE, the work on COBE, Copper Microwave Experiment, won the Nobel Prize for that, but, but he moved on to something next, an instrument that would be capable of looking at what happened to these globs from the early universe. How were galaxies formed? All the great questions. And John said again, it's going to be experience evidence base, and he had the confidence that it could be done. And he was the great scientific leader of this project and uh, very much something that we all have benefited from. I appreciated knowing John in his visits to the factory where we were making the web mirrors uh, and he became a wonderful friend. He came and visited us 10 years ago when we still said web is going to be great. Now we know web is great and we have John Mather. I'd like to uh, have you all give him a warm welcome. Thank you indeed for that warm welcome. Can people hear in the back? Yes or no? Not really. Maybe this will be a little better. Move it up a little higher. Move it up a little higher. Want to say? Now, can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Yes and no. Okay, I better talk louder. <laughs> All right. Um, we're going to change some controls here, too. <clears throat> okay, how's that? Can you hear me now in the back? Yeah. Only sort of. Okay. As usual, trouble with the on-off switch. Thank you all. So, okay, we will proceed. I want to tell you not the secrets of the universe, but the questions of the universe. Uh, if we really had the secret answers, they wouldn't be secret. Uh, do you think government scientists could keep a secret? <laughs> People think there's this area, something or other, where funny things happen. I don't think we could possibly keep a secret about that. Anyway, I want to tell you about the discoveries that we've been making with the Webb telescope and other equipment. Uh, what you see on the screen here is the telescope itself, as we imagine it to be. Uh, of course, we can't see it like that in outer space. What you see is a great golden hexagon. Uh, it is 21 feet across. Uh, apologize for using English units. We should use metric, don't you think? 
<laughs> Six and a half meters across. It is protected by a five layer umbrella, which we call a sunshade. It is as big as a single tennis court. And that was folded up in, to fold inside the rocket to launch it. And it went up on Christmas morning of 2021. Uh, so we are so thrilled to be able to show you what it does. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we're doing it and what we saw. But just to uh, uh, sort of extend the introduction that I've been given, um, I did not do this project myself. See the number on the screen, 20,000 engineers and technicians it took to do this one. The uh, smaller project that did before that we measured the Big Bang radiation, 1,500 people to do that project. So I get to tell you about the work of all these amazing people. In this case, it's a three international space agencies uh, from Europe, Canada, and the United States to put it all together. So let me see if the next uh, toy will work. Can we advance the slide? So two reasons I came to town this week. There is a conference at the Reliability and Maintainability Symposium uh, that was at the Clyde Hotel this week. So that was my first invitation to come out. And as soon as, as I know that's happening, I got to see Tony. So anyway, there, there is such a profession as reliability and maintainability. So if you want to know how to make something gigantic and difficult work, there's a profession to make that happen. It's not an accident that this thing works correctly. We did the right thing. And we have a method. So coming back to why do I do these things? Uh, what are the questions that have been on my mind since I was a little guy and maybe on your minds too? Um, where, do, where do we come from? And then uh, what does we mean? Um, we look at ourselves and we see, oh, I've got a body. We think that's the description of a person. Well, it's not really. Um, what is the history of the universe? How did we get here in the sense of what did the atoms do so we could have an Earth? Uh, then after that, well, how did the atoms behave to make something alive? That's a biologist topic. So I don't know that subject, but I have an opinion. Uh, are we alone? Uh, well, I don't think so. The reason that I think not is that the universe is very large and there, there's 100 billion stars in our own galaxy. We know that most stars have planets. Uh, most, about 20% of them are about the right size and temperature to be like Earth. So there's got to be something out there, unless uh, life requires a completely unlikely miracle. Otherwise, I would call it what we call a thermodynamic imperative, that it will always occur given a chance. That's my guess, but they don't know. So how far can we go? Well, not as far as you wish. If you saw on television that we explode another planet, we got out of our spaceship. I'm sorry. <laughs> we can't go to Mars. Uh, we can't get you back yet because we cannot yet get fuel on the surface of Mars to lift off again. This is a hard engineering project, and some people will go anyway. <laughs> You're laughing. Some people, we want them to go. Anyway, so how did we, quote, get here? So I don't know. Uh, but there's some of the parts I can tell you about from biology. When I was six years old, my dad told me that we are made out of cells with chromosomes and genes in them. So why did he tell me that? Because he was a geneticist studying dairy cows. So that got my attention. And you know, uh, your fate is determined some, by something you can't see. And it's not just where you're born and who your parents are, but a lot of things you can't see. Uh, so that's a mystery. Uh, so I, I knew about evolution from a very early age. Um, there's another, some very interesting books have come out recently. Uh, Robert Sapolsky, who is a primatologist, written, has written something called Determined. So we think we have free will, but we don't have as much as we think. Um, our world is an astonishing thing of complex agents. Uh, so you think, I drew a circle around a body, that's me. Well, that's not really all there is. Uh, my body is made out of uh, 86 billion, roughly, neurons for my brain. Uh, and untold trillions of other cells in there and bacteria and viruses, and they're all working together until they stop working and I die. And I die. So there's a lovely book about this by Stuart Kaufman called Beyond Physics. And, so, and he also explains in this book why there is not really another you, another, other, another planet. It's a mathematical calculation and you can do it. So it means that we can't really say where is the boundary of anything. Anyway, lots of things for, for us to think about which makes the question of where do we come from really interesting, and could there be a society of something on another planet also really interesting. Now, jumping back a little bit into my history, here's the place where I grew up. Looks like a farm. It is a farm. This is where 20 bulls lived. 
And there was also a chemistry lab, and that's where my dad figured things out. Um, it was a really quiet place. Uh, the bookmobile came around every two weeks, and I read every science book I could get from them. That's how I got started in science. So now it's all different. Um, and this place has now become a part of the state park, and my house is a museum. Can you imagine that? Anyway, jumping back to 1946, uh, this is... Uh, Famous astronomer, uh, Wyman Spitzer, after the World War was over, he wrote a report that said, we should build telescopes in outer space. Point them up, point them down, both. A little while later, he wrote a book, that, a report that said, we could polish an asteroid, the parabolic surface, and we would be able to see planets around other stars. Very visionary character. He did not say, well, I know how to do it. He said, we ought to do it. Uh, this picture is not 1946, really. This is Sir Fred Hoyle. He's the guy who has confused the heck out of us for generations now because he gave the name to the Big Bang. So when you hear the name Big Bang, it doesn't, how many people of you here think that means a firecracker? <laughs> yeah. yeah, doesn't it sound like it? It's actually the opposite of what astronomers see. I'll try to explain that a little bit more. We see a, an infinite universe with everything running away from us, not something that originated at a point in existing space and time. So that's why we've been confused. In 1946, this guy turned up. In 1948, I didn't know about this, but the Big Bang Theory was being extended to predict that the universe should be filled with heat left over from the earliest moments. So Robert Alfer on the right and, uh, sorry, Ralph Alfer on the right and Robert Herman on the left calculated that there should be heat with a temperature of five degrees above absolute zero. And uh, they were pretty close, as that answer is 2.7. Uh, nobody went to try to measure it in those days. It was probably too hard, but maybe somebody would have tried if they knew there were a Nobel Prize waiting for them. <laughs> that was done in 1965. Um, and then uh, in uh, about 1954, uh, Mars was really close to, the, to Earth, and my parents took me to see the planetarium show in New York, and people thought there were canals on Mars. And it was, Mars was close. We were going to see them for the first time with a big telescope that we had. Well, they're not there. Any the idea why they weren't there, but why did everybody see them? Those are the probably the blood vessels in the back of the observer's eye. <laughs> and because ro Mars rotates about once every time, you know, every one of our days, you would see the same pattern every day the observer would come. Mm, fool them. <laughs> 1957, uh, this news came out. It scared the crap out of the Americans. It was a little ball that's called the Sputnik, and it went around the Earth and beeped. And it pointed out clearly that there was a potential for space warfare. And this country, we knew it was going to happen, but we hadn't taken it seriously. And suddenly this country said, we better defend ourselves. And uh, Congress said, we're going to spend money on science and engineering. And so suddenly there was a place for me to take my science fair projects. <laughs> and in 1958, uh, Congress created NASA. That's our document up there. And then in 1962, Jack Kennedy gave a speech, and I'm see if it will play for you, announcing that we're going to the moon. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. So we said we're going to the moon, and we're going to take care of the other things too. People ask, often ask me, why are we doing these pure research kinds of things when we've got trouble right here on Earth? And he said, we'll take care of everything. He didn't say we're only going to do that. And by the way, we were in the middle of a Cold War with the Soviet Union. People, people were really scared. And this was a way of fighting a Cold War without killing anybody. 
We did lose three astronauts anyway in an accident on the ground. But at any rate, it worked. Not only did we get to the moon in 1969, which is only like seven years after that. Can you imagine the nerve of a man that said, we've just barely started our space program and we're going to land on the moon? So he did it. And uh, he also started a space astronomy and space exploration. We sent probes to the Mars, probes out of the solar system. So we have honored the honored him, that's James Webb, the man, with the name of this observatory. So that's how we got started. Now we're going to jump back a little bit into astronomy and tell you about the expanded universe. So this is a graph dating to 1929. Edwin Hubble drew this graph. It shows a little dots. Each dot represents a galaxy. Galaxy is about 100 billion stars held together by gravity. Um, and um, and moving around and doing things. So, and the vertical axis shows you how fast they're moving away from us. So you see there's a trend. The farther away they are from the faster they're, they're faster they're going. If you divide the distance by the speed, you get a constant number, which is the apparent age of the universe. This is the first time we ever knew there was such a thing as the age of the universe, because before that we hadn't any idea. So um, this is something that had been predicted. We now this call call this graph or straight line the Hubble Lemaitre law. George Lemaitre was a Catholic priest in Belgium, parish priest, and he was also had a PhD in math from <coughs> MIT, and he calculated from Einstein's equations that this must be true. When Einstein heard this story, he said, "That's ridiculous." <laughs> Einstein has been <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so what happens next? So. I came along in 1970. I was looking for a thesis project at Berkeley as a graduate student. Uh, my thesis project was to measure that heat of the early universe. Uh, before I, the flight of that uh, payload uh, on a balloon, uh, I had a job offer from NASA to work in New York City. So the payload failed to function properly is what I got my postdoc anyway. <laughs> and so six months later, NASA said, Anybody got an idea for a new satellite mission to do some science? So this is only five years after the moon landing. Uh, well, okay, boss, my thesis project failed. How about we try it in outer space? <laughs> a little bit of nerve there, and also not having any idea how hard it was. Um, but that didn't stop us. We wrote a small proposal, and a couple of years later, NASA said, yeah, that's a good enough idea. We're going to study it some more. So in 1989, it went up. So 15 years after the nap napkin sketch, up it went. And it worked. Uh, so I'll show you what we got. Uh, we found two major re re results. Number one, and this wasn't the first one we got, the sky has hot and cold spots on it. When you look at the radiation from the earliest moments of time, uh, this is the universe as we think it was when it was about 400,000 years old. Uh, and this is a map of the entire sky stretched out and flattened onto an oval so you can see it. Um, so hot and cold spots. So why are they there? Well, that's a good question. Uh, Stephen Hawking saw this picture and he said that's the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. So I thought at first, well, that's just really nice of you to say that. <laughs> and then, of course, we had to appreciate why was it so darn important? So number one, well, we think we wouldn't be here if there were no spots like that. Because those spots represent the reason why gravity could have overcome the expansion of the material and pull it back in locally to form galaxies. So almost all the material in the expanding universe has now been pulled back in to make objects like galaxies. So we're here because of those spots. Number two, the spots represent the effects of dark matter and dark energy. We wouldn't be here like we are without them. And astronomers claim that they exist, but nobody else can see them. Nobody can see them because they're really transparent. And maybe the third point is, if we ever understand what made those spots, we'll have some hint about quantum gravity, which is one of the greatest mysteries we have in science. We don't know whether it should even be quantized, but if there is quantum gravity, it means that space and time aren't even, even fundamental, but they're jiggling around randomly too. So a lot of questions are open for that. Uh, but this is tell you what the universe was like when it was young. The graph on the left is our measurement of the spectrum, which is to say how bright is this cosmic heat at each wavelength. And the, uh, I got a standing ovation for showing, showing that chart to the astronomers about six weeks after lunch. So that says the expanding universe story is probably right. 
uh, and the herbivores, those little bugs are really tiny. And then after a few more years of work, they, you couldn't even see them on the chart. So uh, that was the best measurement that had ever been made of that sort. So there I am with the King of Sweden receiving my diploma in 2006 for that work. By the way, I got a check and I spent it. <laughs> I didn't spend it on hamburger, I spent it on scholarships for physics and engineering students and dance students. My wife, my late wife, was a ballet teacher. So, in honor of partnership, do that. So, okay, so how do you know if this story that I'm telling you is true? Well, uh, in April of 1990, only what, five months or so after the Kobe satellite was launched, we put this bird up, the Hubble Space Telescope. We started taking pictures with it. And as was mentioned, uh, it was out of focus. Oh, golly. Well, it took us a few years to get it in focus. And when ast astronauts had to go up and fix it, which we are very fortunate we were able to do. Uh, and after it was fixed, astronomers immediately knew what we needed to do next. Please build us another telescope that's even more powerful than that one, um, because the, we knew we had missed, well, we knew this couldn't possibly have met our wishes in every area. So in particular, we would not be able to see the formation of the first galaxies after the Big Bang. So it would, by the way, it was all the same. When the first pictures came out properly, the internet finished. <laughs> It was, the internet was young in 19. Okay, so they said build this telescope, which we now call the James Webb Space Telescope. And there it is. Uh, as and I just would picture it for you. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, it's an international partnership project with Europe and Canada. Um, it has been led from Goddard Space Flight Center, just outside Washington, D.C. That's where I work. And um, it has four instruments on board, which take pictures and make spectra. A spectrum uh, spreads out the light of a star or a galaxy into a rainbow of colors. So you can see how bright it is at each wavelength. And that's important to us because it tells us chemistry and it tells us motions of things. So uh, we have instruments from all over the world, from the United States, Europe, and Canada, anyway. Uh, and we launched it, as I mentioned, on Christmas morning, 2021. We got a, basically a perfect launch that uh, gives us about 20 more years of operation. I'd like to thank the people who have made this possible. There are four of our project managers. It took a long time, and um, we wore some of them out, almost. Um, anyway, they're all very proud of what we did uh, because it works so beautifully in space. There are two more people to thank. Senator Mikulski <clears throat> corralled the support we needed in Congress when we needed more money. Um, at a certain point around 2011, we realized the plan was not good enough. Uh, the project was harder than we thought, and the uh, review committee said, uh, did good work, did not ask for enough money. She was able then to convince the rest of Congress to support the rest of the work that it would take. And that's Charlie Bolden there. He was a massive at that time. So the two of them worked together to make this happen. By the way, I never went to, con to Congress to tell them about, about this story. It's not my part. We had <coughs> to admit, oh, excuse me, Lots of new kinds of technology. They don't really want to tell you all the details, except we didn't know how to make anything that we really needed when we started. So when we have that problem, what we do, when we have a competition, we say, okay, world, tell us how you would do it. We receive proposals, and after enough work, we say, okay, that's good enough. So here's our launch coming up. <clears throat> There's the launch. It was actually nine o'clock in the morning, although it looks dark there as they, as they set the camera. Anyway, perfect launch, directly where we needed to go, which was the place we call the Sun Earth Lagrange Point One. <clears throat> there are five points in the solar system where if you pull it an object, it can move around the sun once a year like we do. And so we choose the one called L2, uh, which is a million miles from here overhead at midnight. And it's a place to put a telescope where the Earth, Sun, and Moon are all in one direction. You can make, make the telescope cold with the umbrella. <clears throat> and so here's the telescope unfolding in outer space. This is our scary movie. 
Uh, you might remember the uh, seven minutes of terror that we had for the Mars landing for the little robot out there. This is actually a little longer and it's not quite so terrifying because we had this set up. So if anything went wrong, we could stop and figure it out and do it again, which was not possible for the Mars lander. Anyway, if what we did first here was we unfolded the solar panels and the antenna. Now we're unfolding the mechanical structure. You see something extraordinary complicated and you say, isn't that awfully complicated? Uh, yeah. Um, and if we could have done it more simply, we would have. But we needed a telescope so large to be, be able to see the first objects growing from the early universe. If you're the budget keeper, you say, how can I possibly pay for all that? Um, and if you're the risk manager, you have to say, how am I going to make sure it's right? So, of course, we had a very, very formal process to make sure that. So this is uh, took about two weeks to get this far, at which point the telescope is still warm and it's not in focus. And it took all of six months altogether to get it all set up and ready to take pictures. So it's beautiful, it's complicated, and it's working beautifully. And it's not an accident. So I wrote this chart for the risk management people. I thought, well, how do you know how to make something work? And some of this might apply to some of you. Uh, Murphy was an optimist, <laughs> which means uh, Murphy's law says it's going to fail if you test it. What if it fails after you test it? Well, we had a few of those, but we got lucky we found them. Um, we are really can-do kind of people. I can do that. Oh, I can do that. I can reach off the head of my ladder. I can paint that over there. I can clear my ladder out. How many people have fallen off a ladder? <laughs> uh, quite a lot of us. At least 12 of my friends have done that. <laughs> and one died. So I take this seriously. We're not good at risk analysis. <laughs> we need a formal process. And we have a formal process to do this. Uh, there was a claim that from a, fail, a, a statement that we made during the Apollo 13 that failure is not an option. Well, for us, anything this complicated, if you don't do it right, failure is guaranteed. So that's pretty important for us. I also just like to say, uh, don't ask me if it's going to work. I don't have any effect on that hardware. My opinion doesn't do anything. I learned also once uh, that I was the boss of something and I made some big mistakes. So I say, do not trust the boss, especially if you are the boss. You've got to get some way to check your work. Um, and so forth. There are lots more you can say about this. Now we're going to talk about what did we see and why did we do this? Uh, the Webb telescope is designed to pick up infrared light. So what's infrared? It's the same as ordinary light, but the wavelengths are longer. And it comes from things that are too cool to, to emit their own visible light. So we've got three basic reasons. Excuse me a second. So <clears throat> there are things that are hidden in dust clouds. So <clears throat> here's a star being born. Can you see it? Yeah. Sort of. There's a little wiggly thing right there in the middle. And there's this huge cloud of dust, which is the home of that new star. So we'd like to know how that works. Well, <clears throat> you can see inside if you can use infrared. You push the button here. Here's the infrared version of that picture. So why can you see through a dust cloud with infrared when you can't see with visible light? It's because light's a wave. Light will go around things that are smaller than the wavelength and will bounce off things that are bigger than the wavelength. So use longer wavelengths to see inside dust clouds. Now I should also tell you, where did that dust come from? It came from stars that blew up or disintegrated. So when you look around the building here, you say, oh, well, what's this place made of? Car calcium for the rocks, uh, carbon for you and me, oxygen for the air, nitrogen, all lots of other things. None of those were there in the Big Bang material. We only had hydrogen and helium after the first three minutes. So, okay, where did the rest of it come from? Stars that blew up one way or another. And there's a lot to know about that. Um, in fact, I have a picture of stars in the process of disintegrating. <clears throat> These are also stars where they, you can actually see the dust coming out. So it's sort of circular, but not quite. Uh, when people called it a planetary nebula a long time ago, that's because they thought it looked like a planet 
but you can see it's not. Anyway, a magnified picture shows the detail down inside. And there, we think now there are actually five stars in this core of this thing, and one of them is in the process of blowing up. So think carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen coming out so they can be recycled to make a new generation of stars and planets and maybe new people somewhere else. So you're all recycled. It's okay, right? Yeah, I hope you don't mind being recycled. So, okay. So third reason to use infrared light is to that space is expanding in the sense that distant objects are running away from us really fast. So this graphic is supposed to illustrate that idea. Um, so the farther away, they, the faster they go and things like that. So we need infrared light to be able to pick up the most distant universe. And because things are really far and are far away, are moving away from us. Which leads us to our first data release. Uh, this is the one we put out on uh, July 11th of uh, 2022. <clears throat> the first data release, which we did at the White House. So I got to say, shake the president's hand. And this is more important. Uh, what we see here in the picture are some stars. You see those things with the bright spikes sticking out? Those are stars. Um, the pattern is due to the hexagonal mirrors that we have. You see some big, fuzzy, bright things in the middle, and those are extremely massive galaxies relatively nearby. And we see a lot of funny-looking little pink arcs, and those are magnified and distorted images of much more distant objects. So what's doing the magnified? Those galaxies in the middle. Uh, gal gravity bends space. And so that means light can be focused and bent by gravity. Einstein said it would happen. Uh, even Newton thought about whether it could happen. Um, and it does happen. So we can use nature's lenses to extend our reach quite a lot. And in fact, uh, it is so good that once in a while we see an individual star way out there. And we can tell that it's one star, not just a, a stretched out image of a far away galaxy, but a single star. So what have we found about these objects way out there? Well, number one, the first galaxies uh, are too bright, too numerous, too hot, uh, and too, ma too mature, and too soon, according to what we thought was going on. So that's not a problem about the universe. It's a problem about us, you see. Uh, so we have to go back to our drawing board and think again. Uh, why is that so? Uh, we also just a couple of weeks ago announced that they are stringy. Uh, they are shaped. They're not round. Uh, a lot of them are oblong or banana shaped or cigar shaped. And you say, well, you know, they're not just round one seen edge on. And the answer is you have to do some statistics. <clears throat> if they were around, how many of these would you see? And not enough. So this is a brand new result. So how, how do we know? How do we explain this? Well, maybe we can, maybe we can. But if we have the, the possibility of lowering the lights for a moment, I will show you a movie. Can we do that? <coughs> Let's see if we have a moment to try that. Okay, maybe not. Anyway, I want to show you the movie. So, anyway, here is a movie simulating the formation of galaxies, starting with the random dots that we saw on the pink and blue blobs in the early universe. So, after a fraction of a billion years, already galaxies seem to be strung out in strings. And once in a while, they're even arranged in sheets. So maybe we shouldn't be too darn surprised if the galaxies we found are shaped like bananas. Sorry. Uh, anyway, I think you saw the point. The movie is beautiful. Yeah. And the uh, we do have a way of beginning to understand how the galaxies grow. Um, so now the question is, is this movie right? Well, not in specifics, because we just chose random numbers to start the computer. Uh, but we do find objects in these simulations that look like the Milky Way. Uh, we do see explosions in this simulation that are similar to what we see in real galaxies. And we do see these sheets of material in, this, in the real sky, as the simulation is showing us. So you say, well, is this about right? We're just beginning that question. If somebody hands you a computer program with a billion pages of output, how are you going to know if you believe what it says? <laughs> you need a pretty good computer program to analyze the computer program. <laughs> and you need some really smart people, but we're working on it. 
So when the universe is about 9 billion years old, about two thirds of its present age, the solar system is being formed. So a little bit before this. So there, the solar system is being formed at this point in the movie. And so the little old sun orbiting a very ordinary galaxy, uh, one of billions and billions. So by the way, are we significant? Yeah. We, we care about each other, don't we? Uh, are we significant in the cosmic sense? Well, we don't know if anybody else is out there. But and I would hope that they would care about us if we care about them. So there it is. Uh, I think the most beautiful movie I've ever seen. Even better than science fiction stories. <laughs> okay, so what else have we seen? This is a magnified picture of a, an early galaxy, and it's got little blobs all over it. Um, this is due to the gravitational lens that Einstein gave us or told us about. Um, so this very early galaxy has little things called globular clusters all over it. So eventually we'll know how that works. Did globular clusters, this little ones come first and then they merge together to make a galaxy or vice versa. Here is a picture showing that we had a picture of a single individual star way out there magnified by like 10,000 times. And here, are, I'm showing you some of the pictures we got, partly because they're beautiful, partly because astronomers are using them. Uh, this is five galaxies. The one on the left is separate from the others. And we got a good enough picture that you can actually see individual stars in it. Uh, the two at the top, there are really two in the, in the top image. Sorry, there are two in the middle that are in the process of merging. The one in the top has a black hole in the middle. It's very, very bright there. So this is a place to learn how galaxies merge. We study this picture. We measure the velocities of the parts out there. See the star, the new star is being born in those pink sections. And so we learn about star formation and, and collisions of galaxies. By the way, we're going to have a collision here in a couple of billion years, that beautiful Andromeda Nebula, M31, will come and hit us. Uh, we won't be here yet because or anymore because the sun will be too bright for us to live here, I'm sorry. Um, but a billion years, uh, we got a, about a good billion years before that happens. Uh, anyway, um, there will be a collision of our Milky Way with that galaxy, and there will be a great splash. Uh, another splash we've very recently observed, this is called the cartwheel because of the appearance. What we see here is uh, the little galaxy in the top left went straight through the middle of the one in the right. So that's our interpretation of the picture. Obviously, we did not watch this happen over time, but it seems a pretty good story to me. Here is a galaxy with a hole in it. When we first took a picture of this with ordinary light, it looked like an ordinary spiral galaxy. Now you see that it looks like it's got holes in it, and why is that? Um, in a sponge, we have holes because of gas pressure. In this one, we have holes because of gas pressure. So where does the gas pressure come from? We'll see this little hole in the lower right-hand corner. Um, we think a, a generation of extremely hot, bright, energetic stars uh, turned on in there and they released so much energy, they were able to push away the near, nearby material and then piled up around the edge, which is why you see a luminous ring around the hole. That's where the new stars are being born today. A similar story in here, this is called the Pillars of Creation. Uh, and the way in the top right is an area where new stars have been born recently. They're sending out a wind. You can sort of see the wind blowing past these, <laughs> these objects. And this is a place where stars are being born inside. Um, you can see in a few places, there's one, there's one, I maybe you can make it out. I don't think my mouse will show it to you. Sort of in the middle, a little bit right in the middle. It's a red, a bright dot at the end of a column, a dark material. This is a new star, which is just beginning to burst out of its cocoon. So a star formation laboratory. We want to know how stars are born and how they make planets. Here is one which are, we are seeing right in the act. Uh, we think right in the middle, in the, bigger, the middle of the hamburger, in the middle is a star. Uh, its direct light is being blocked. So by the orbiting dust around it, see, uh, the solar system is flat. It's got a whole lot of dust orbiting around with the planets. In this early system, all the dust is in a flat pancake. 
And so we can see the star. We can see that it's shining upwards and downwards. And so this is a place presumably with planets being born in there in that dust cloud. Come back later, a few hundred thousand years, maybe the dust will be gone and we'll see the planets. We have seen some remarkable objects that we did not expect this. Uh, Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. And we thought, well, usually planets like that will be formed orbiting big stars. Well, here there we've found by observation, they're often formed in pairs without a big star. A little surprise, they're pretty to look at. There are a lot of these there, at least 25 of them have been found in the Orion Nebula. So big surprise is coming. Uh, here is our method for observing planets around other stars, exoplanets, they're called. Um, if you watch a lot of stars for a long time, you'll see that they blink sometimes. And if a star blinks regularly every week or so, you say, well, I think a planet went in front of the star. And in that case, uh, I know how long it takes to go around. You can calculate how big it is by how much starlight has been blocked. You can calculate how warm it is by how far away it is from the star. Uh, and all those kinds of things I could get. So now I know something about the planet. Uh, are there any of them that are like Earth? Well, yeah, a lot of them are the right size and temperature to be like Earth. Uh, but so far, we are not aware of any that have an atmosphere. We can do this trick for bigger planets, and they do have an atmosphere because that's what they are, um, like Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune in our solar system. They're all gas all the time. Maybe there's a metallic core down in the center that we wouldn't be able to see. Anyway, so what have we seen? Well, we have seen lots of interesting molecules out there and atoms. We've seen sodium and potassium and carbon dioxide and ammonia and water. Um, so far, no oxygen. Uh, we weren't expecting it. But why would you care about oxygen? Well, by the way, uh, if you saw oxygen and water and carbon dioxide all in one planet, you'd say, well, that sounds a lot like home, doesn't it? Right here at home, uh, oxygen is produced by photosynthesis and it is very reactive, so it would all go away very quickly if there were no plants and algae. So we're definitely going to look for that in our next shot. I uh, want to show you some more beautiful pictures. Here is Jupiter. Jupiter has an aurora north and south, which we see uh, this way. Um, it has a great red spot, which is not red here. Because, of course, infrared doesn't show you the right colors that you would think of. So this is where we tell you how do you make colors for an infrared picture. Um, usually the way we do it is uh, the short wavelength is shown as blue. The medium wavelengths are yellow or green. Long wavelengths are red. So it's an artificial color, but at least it makes some sense. Uh, once in a while we do something different. We say, well, we see all the oxygen. Let's color it green. So we have our ways to do this to make them easy to interpret. But anyway, that's a wonderful challenge. You can see the detail of the clouds running around the red, red spot. And we still don't understand after four centuries. Galileo saw that spot in 1609. And then it went away for a while, and then it came back. And it's, so it's been going for hundreds of years and we don't understand. We don't even think there's a solid surface underneath, but nevertheless, there's a persistent storm that's as big as the planet Earth running around on, on, on Jupiter. What else have we been doing? We took a picture of an asteroid attack, but we attacked an asteroid. Uh, this is a picture taken with Hubble on the left and Webb telescope on the right. We dropped a big chunk of metal on an asteroid to see what would happen. So what does happen? Well, the debris comes flying out of the asteroid. And we also wanted to see how far does it move when you hit it, because we're trying to learn how to deflect an asteroid that might be dangerous to us. So it was a very valuable experiment. The uh, asteroid moved five times as much as you might have expected, because um, that debris that comes out actually pushes back on the rest of the asteroid. So learning how to defend ourselves learning about a place we're going to land. This is Titan, which is a satellite of Saturn. It is the big satellite big enough to have its own atmosphere. So we are sending a helicopter. There is the drawing of it landing there in 2034. Uh, so of course, we want to know what is the chemistry of the surface where we're going to land. So learning about that with the wind telescope. 
And is there any reason why we shouldn't land where we were planning? By the way, we already landed something on Mar on, on many years ago, uh, and we found out that the surface is is made of ice, and it's got the atmospheric phenomena. It's got rain and clouds and lakes and rivers, and they're made out of liquid hydrocarbons like ethane and methane. And the rest of the atmosphere is nitrogen. So we know where we're going, and we're knowing going to, we're going to land there, and we're going to be hopping around looking at the geology. Although it's not really geology, because geo means earth, doesn't it? <laughs> you got a lovely picture of Uranus, uh, and you see it uh, on looking down on the rainbow. So, so how is that possible? All the other planets in the solar system have their spin axis perpendicular to the plane of the Earth, not Uranus. So something pretty dramatic happened. It changed the spin axis that much. Uh, and we don't know what. And then we get up to the picture of the rings, and you see on the left hand side lots of satellites with uh, Shakespearean names. <laughs> so a lot of satellites have Roman mythological names or Greek mythological names, and now we have some that have Hawaiian mythological names because we've got telescopes in Hawaii. So there's a lot more to tell you, but I'll uh, stop here and uh, say if you want to follow us. On the internet, there are plenty of ways to do so, and uh, maybe you have some time for questions. So, people in the other room, I don't know how we can get questions with you, but we can. Uh, people will ask questions here, and we can talk about it. So, thank you very much for coming to hear this story. It's up in a moment. You could. Do those things. Think of your questions. There's no such thing as a bad question. Okay, already I see questions. Uh, let me take yours first while we're waiting for microphones. I'll see if I can repeat it. Sorry, right, what's uh, what's your favorite science fiction story? Now, my favorite science fiction story is a holy. It's called Forbidden Planet. A lot of people say they know this one. It's terrifying. It's ordinary. Except it's not. The previous civilization had hollowed out a planet and filled it up with the equipment that could make your wishes come true. That's more dangerous than you could imagine. Okay, uh, do we have a microphone yet set up? Or shall we just take have a microphone? Okay, let's start here. Oh, do we take still pictures? We can take movies, uh, but not very quickly. No, not very many things change fast in astronomy. Hey, no, nobody do. We have a whole new domain <clears throat> of astronomy called time domain. And I'll be messing to astronomy. Things will flash. And we got to find out what that is. It's hard to do because it happens over there, but you were looking over there. But we're working on it. In the front. What's on your wish list for the next telescope? What's on my wish list for the next telescope? Did, uh, we have one already in the building called Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. She was the head astronomer at NASA for decades, a friend of mine. And uh, it's going to be surveying much of the sky, looking for evidence of dark matter and dark energy, and looking for planets. Probably not capable of finding an Earth, but we'll look. And lots of other things. It's a survey of a lot of the sky. The big one to follow that one would be as big as the web. Uh, and capable of seeing little Earth orbiting another star and see the little dot as a separate thing. Mm. And why do you want to do that? So you can see the chemistry of that other planet. Does it have oxygen? Does it have water? Does it have carbon dioxide in its atmosphere? And could it possibly be a little bit like home? So what do you think? Are there some? I think so. She thinks so. Uh, yeah. Well, we don't know yet. They could be rare. They could be common. Okay. Um, well, let's see other questions to close up that I could hear. Okay. Okay, let me walk over to where I can hear better. Okay. Okay. Uh, if the universe is always expanding, how does that work along with the great attractor? Oh, the universe is always expanding. He wants to know about the great attractor. Well, the great attractor is a place in space where there are a lot of galaxies together. And so indeed, uh, locally, other galaxies are falling in that direction. So are we. Um, we're falling in that direction because there's a lot of mass concentrated, but it's not enough to stop the expansion of the whole universe. So gravity binds things together that are small enough. The solar system is not expanding um, because gravity sticks everything together. The things that are far apart still are rushing away. 
Okay, here's a question. I have a question. So did I hear you right when you said that that uh, the gas giant uh, type planets uh, like to form in, in sets of two around? Well, we were surprised that they did. We thought uh, that all the planets, normal planets would form orbiting around bigger stars. But there they are forming by themselves. So how did that happen? Well, we don't know yet. We'll tell you later. <laughs> okay, there's a question. Okay. Oh, he wants to know what happens when two black holes collide. Well, we actually found out because we observed the result. Um, when two black holes collide, what they usually do is they come close and they orbit around each other, and then they go faster and faster and faster. And when they finally squeeze together, they send out a burst of gravitational energy, which we receive as a wave. And we built some special antennas to find out if this was true, and they, we saw it happen. So black holes really can combine to make a bigger black hole, releasing more energy. And there's another story to go with that one. Uh, you could ask what happens when stars collide. So what they do occasionally. Uh, sometimes it's a big splash. There is a special kind called a neutron star. When a star about the mass of the sun gets old, it can shrink down to a very small size, about as big as a city. And if two, <clears throat> if two of those get close together, they're both, both made out of neutrons now, they squish together, part of it turns into a black hole, part of it gets squished out again with heavy elements. So the gold that I'm wearing for my wedding ring came from that. <laughs> so you don't know, you don't think you're wearing debris from neutron star collisions on your ring, but you are. <laughs> Not only are we dust returned and recycled, we used to be, pieces of us used to be almost black holes. We, we escaped. So, question back here. Um, so, I have heard that some stars can create heavy elements in a ball when they smash stuff together, and I have heard they can sometimes create elements heavier than iron. What's possibly the heaviest element that could be created? Oh, he's asking, in the cores of stars, um, what's the heaviest elements that you can create in the cores of stars? So, when ordinarily, when uh, hydrogen burns into helium and helium then burns, and we work all the way up to that to iron is the product of burning all of those things together. And that's the end of what you can get by combustion of, or kind of combustion of nuclear reactions. But then what happens is a star can blow up, become unstable, and all of a sudden the temperatures and everything are so extreme you can build up all the other elements. That's what we thought for a long time. And then we found out about these neutron stars. And so the very heaviest elements come from neut neutron stars and the other is sort of in between. So we got a lot of ways uh, that the elements you see around you came to be. You know, neutron stars are my favorite space objects. <laughs> he said neutron stars are his favorite space objects. Well, uh, just let's not get too close. <laughs> okay. Why do you suppose life only started once on Earth? He says, why do I suppose life only started once on Earth? Well, it's, of course, not my area of expertise. But honestly, we don't know that. We see that all the life we see today is very closely related. Uh, all the living things that have genetic material share the same code and the same meanings and genes and so forth. So we are led to think, well, it's all one thing. Uh, but could be that it started many times and our ancestors ate the others. <laughs> we don't know. So, But it's a good question. So if we were to find life elsewhere, we'd like to know, in particular, would it be like ours? So here we have a special thing. We have a, the fact that polarized light rotates when it goes through organic material. And it always rotates in, the, rotates in the same direction. So if you found life on another planet, would it rotate the opposite way? Then we'd know it was a separate star. And if we ever found life here that rotated everything the other way, we'd say, well, there really are two surviving kinds. So it's a hard question. It's not a question I could answer. Okay. Okay, over here. How much do we know about dark matter? We know what it does, but we don't know anything else. <laughs> dark matter has gravity. Uh, it makes galaxies orbit differently. It makes gravity, uh, makes the starlight bend around gravity uh, galaxies like I showed you in the picture. Um, 
It makes galaxies spin differently. The Milky Way spins more rapidly than it could if there were no dark matter to pull it together. So we've had knowledge of this since 1935. And we have no evidence at all in any laboratory experiment of what else it is. We are kind of sore about this. <laughs> Generations of physicists have been building equipment to look for this stuff, and it does not turn up. So maybe that means it won't. And then maybe it means we have to try harder or try something else. So I'm sorry I can't really tell you much more, um, but it's a very hot topic. And if you keep at it, maybe you'll have a chance to find out. <laughs> All right, so please do keep at it. Okay, let me take a question away up here. I was wondering what your thinking is on uh, fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the Big Bang. Uh, he's asking about the uh, finding fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the Big Bang. And this is um, a question of what, what made it come out so exactly the way that it is. Um, as you can imagine, well, suppose that the initial expansion had been just a little less energetic, it would have gone out, collapsed back in. Or maybe it was a little too energetic, it would have fl flown apart so fast, we wouldn't see anything. It would all be spread out so far by now, nothing left. So honestly, I don't have a proper opinion by your question. I just wanted the audience to know what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> Change in the back row there. Everybody stop expanding. Is the universe ever going to stop expanding? Uh, honestly, we couldn't be sure, uh, but right now it's accelerating. It's going faster and faster all the time. Uh, and this was a huge surprise, and we got a Nobel Prize for that discovery a few years ago. Uh, the people that were trying to measure were, were sure that they were going to measure how it was slowing down. <laughs> and when a young postdoc said, that's not what I'm seeing, people said, you better check your work. <laughs> so he was right. They were right. And they went. three people went off to Stockholm to get their Nobel Prize for that discovery. It was a huge shock. Uh, most people did not expect that. Charlie, could you take a couple more questions? Oh, a couple more, yeah. Okay, and they're in the red. What's your thoughts on the axis of evil? Are you there with that? Okay, there's the <laughs> axis of evil. Uh, there seems to be a pattern in those pink and blue blobs that I showed you um, that says maybe there's a there's a maybe the universe is like a like it was spinning. That's a preferred pattern, and um, thoughts are mixed. Maybe there's a uh, maybe we take it as evidence that there's structures um, large, much larger than the piece of universe that we can study. Because we can only study the universe that we're in, uh, we can only see a certain distance out because there's an age. We can't see any farther. So, and that could be that there's a big surprise waiting for us out there. If we could, see, if we could wait another 10 billion years, maybe we'd see more. Uh, and we could just be that nature is fooling us. <laughs> so... Uh, this may be a permanent mystery for us. Okay. And there was one more question. Um, okay. Here we go. The, life, the lifetime of, of, the, of the instrument, how long is it? Yeah. And can you extend it? I mean, a million miles is, or a million miles is not that far out. Yeah, he's asking, can we extend the lifetime of the Webb telescope? We have fuel on board for about 20 more years, which is way more than we were hoping for. So we're pretty happy about that. So... We are prepared in case we ever really need to, uh, to send a robot out. We painted a pattern on the end, the warm end, so we know a camera and a robot could figure out how to latch on. The hard problem is, and then, and then what do you do? <laughs> but there is uh, the possibility of a good robot that could get at the fuel tank and put some more in. What I think is gonna happen is, uh, by then we'll be building the next great telescope and people will say, better get that one going, please. <laughs> and we'll have a discussion of whether we need to keep on fixing the old car or build a new one. We had to do that with the Hubble, and we decided to keep the Hubble and build a new one. And we're glad we did. The Hubble's still operating. The Hubble's still operating, and uh, it will eventually have to be tossed somewhere because we can't let it hit New York. Let us thank Dr. Miller. It's been a marvelous time. I don't want Mather to walk over to the overflow rooms and say hi to them. This is only a fraction of the audience for tonight.